The future of aviation could be an aircraft light enough to be carried by a grad student, rugged enough to take off from a grassy field, and flexible enough to do just about anything in the air. Not firing missiles, this one's designed to chase storms in Tornado Alley, but it could just as easily search for someone who's missing, relay communications in an emergency, monitor a pipeline for leaks, maybe even deliver packages. You want to do this mission? You put in this set of sensors. You want to do this next mission? You put in another set of sensors and communications capabilities and so forth. Put the right equipment on board and drones could be useful to lots of different industries and government sectors. So useful that sales of the pilotless aircraft might just take off. Within a couple hours drive of this field near Boulder, Colorado startups and established aviation companies are gearing up to meet that expected demand. The manufacturers are part of a statewide effort to convince the Federal Aviation Administration to put one of the six drone testing sites it's about to announce in Colorado. If the state has an edge over the 23 others in the running, it may be this man. Brian Argro is a professor of aerospace engineering at the University of Colorado Boulder. He's been studying drones for nearly 20 years, and he taught some of the engineers who develop new drone technology here. The idea that you're gonna sit at a console with a joystick in your hand, with a video feed coming from the cameras on the aircraft, and you're gonna be flying that around in the air. No, that's technology from the 80s and 90s. This is a new century, and autonomy, that will be the, that will be the future. It's essentially, essentially what you're talking about is a flying robot, then. Uh, it's, already, it's already a flying robot. Right now it's flying with the computer brains, not by me. People who build these flying robots would prefer that the public and reporters not call them drones. One of the terms they prefer is UAS, for Unmanned Aircraft Systems. And the unmanned part is another big selling point. The UAS can, doesn't care that the pilot's tired or whatever. It'll sit there until it, you either tell it to come home or it runs you know, low on fuel or whatever. A UAS also doesn't earn a pilot's salary, and most use less fuel than manned aircraft. Bottom line, they're cheaper to fly. So much cheaper that businesses that can only dream about using manned aircraft today could end up flying their very own drones. For example, architects and real estate developers might want them to fly over buildings in the surrounding neighborhoods in order to scan them to build 3D models. Argro thinks UAS's killer app will be in agriculture. The founder of a startup in a Denver suburb is betting on that. I think that it's going to be a, just a windfall of opportunity. Alan Bishop's firm Reference Technologies builds drones that take off, hover, and land like helicopters. He thinks they'll be as common on farms as tractors and pickup trucks. Corn, wheat, there's all types of diseases that infect those plants. Historically, they would call up the local sprayer and he'll spray the entire field. With this technology, you send this unit out and it can determine the segment of the field that's in infested, and that's the only part that needs to be sprayed. That would save money for farmers and could mean less residue from chemicals that treat agricultural diseases on the dinner table. Some of Bishop's drones look like the four rotor copters you might see hobbyists piloting by remote, but these are flying robots that pilot themselves. Our big unit can take off from this parking lot and land on the pitcher's mound at Coors Field with hands off. Wow. Wow. You just program, yeah. you just program the GPS. And and you through. use the GPS maps and you go click, click, click the waypoints. You look for any uh, obstructions along the way. And about 30 minutes later, it shows up at Coors Field landing on the <laughs> pitcher's mound. <laughs> Hopefully not during We the wouldn't game. do it during a <laughs> game, for sure. <laughs> That model can stay in the air for five hours with 20 pounds of equipment on board. Right now, there are over 500 drones flying in the U.S. Five years from now, the Federal Aviation Administration projects there'll be about 7,500. By 2025, an industry group expects tens of thousands. Bishop is even more optimistic. How many drones do you think will be commercially in the air in the United States in, say, 10 years? In 10 years? 100,000 plus, 100,000, easily. But right now, FAA rules make it next to impossible for farmers, corporations, pretty much any part of the private sector to get the permits that are necessary to fly them. Even Bishop doesn't have a permit, so he doesn't fly his drones to a baseball stadium or any place else unless they're tethered to the ground with fishing line. 
If the FAA were to make it easier for the private sector to buy and fly UASs, a trade group estimates that Colorado's drone industry would do $20 million worth of business in the first year alone, then grow exponentially. But efforts to boost the industry have been flying into a stiff headwind. With thousands of these birds in the air in a few years, there are some concerns. First, that these might run into conflicts with existing manned aircraft. Secondly, a lot of these birds in the air are also eyes in the sky. When you first learned that Colorado was pushing to become a testing site for drones, sure. what was your first reaction? <laughs> well, in some ways it was, whoa, wait a minute, right? We, we don't have, in my mind, what the privacy rules should be in place before we talk about any sort of escalation in, the, um, in putting the, the drones up in the air. We haven't laid the appropriate groundwork for them. Denise Mays is with the ACLU of Colorado. She says there are legitimate reasons for firefighters and law enforcement to use drones, like search and rescue operations. But she worries that those same eyes in the skies will end up being used for what she thinks are less than legitimate purposes. If you have a drone that's being launched for the purpose of finding a hot spot in a fire, and in route, it gathers private information about private citizens, on their private property and retains that data and then later wants to use it in a criminal proceeding or what, that's the problem. So it sounds like really this is, this is one of those slippery slope arguments in a way. Once you put drones in the hands of law enforcement, they're just going to kind of keep expanding the way that they use them. That's certainly what, what we fear. I think the, the rush to um, get the permits, get the technology going, launch them, and we'll worry about repercussions later. We'll fix them as they come up is not is not good policy making. The Airline Pilots Association also wants drones to remain grounded while regulators develop rules for them. The union wants the Federal Aviation Administration to make sure UASs don't compromise the safety of nearly a quarter million manned aircraft in the country. I think the way that they're going to do this effectively is to do it very methodically, um, not to suddenly uh, completely um, clobber the integrated airspace with an abundance of UAVs. Sean Cassidy is a union vice president and a former Navy pilot who captains passenger jets. His union wants every unmanned aircraft to have a human being at a set of remote controls every time one takes to the skies, even if it's capable of flying itself. Somebody physically on board the airplane or physically on the ground flying that airplane has to have an understanding of the performance char characteristics of that, air of that vessel they have to understand what the consequences are if they, if they misuse it. You just can't walk in off the street just like some kid uh, flying, a, uh, flying a, 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 game, a game machine somewhere. Cassidy says the good news is that the FAA's plan for bringing drones into the nation's airspace proposes some kind of pilot certification. It also requires high-tech safety systems for drones that can sense and avoid collisions, keep the radio link with the control station secure from malicious hackers or terrorists, and more. But the bad news, he says, is that Congress ordered the FAA to let more drones start flying by September of 2015, and he thinks that may be too soon. What's a reasonable timeline for this? I think the reasonable timeline is the one that's the safe timeline. I don't think the technical and safety work that's required is going to be accomplished by then. We have to be compliant with the FAA's rules and regulations. Colorado drone entrepreneur Alan Bishop says he's sympathetic to the professional pilot's concerns because he's a private pilot. But he's not sympathetic to fears that drones will invade the public's privacy because there are already devices that can do that. The public just doesn't think about them. We're not going to make Apple take the camera out of their iPhones. Not going to happen. We have initial negative things about things we don't understand or that we feel we can't control. And drones or UASs clearly fall into that category. They're high-tech devices. They have extraordinary capabilities. They fly. More than anything, Alan Bishop just wants to be allowed to let his drones off their leashes so they can prove to everyone that they're as useful as he thinks they'll turn out to be. Aerospace engineering professor Brian Argro can already do that. The FAA rules that keep Bishop's drones on leashes don't apply to researchers at state universities, so Argro's team has been flying them for years. He understands the frustration with the slow process of getting them off the ground. 
But drones present complex problems, so he's not sure he'd advise regulators at the FAA to move any faster. What's the alternative? A free-for-all where everybody goes out and flies these things and you start bringing down manned aircraft? Argro sees drones as a 